Good morning, good evening, or good riddance. Welcome to the Spire Riffcast, where we'll be discussing all things metal, non-metal, and every point in between. With this podcast, we hope to lift the veil on our world and metal music and dig into some topics we've wanted to share with all of you. This will be informal, so please take our content with a grain of salt and a sense of humor. Right now, you're listening to the Riffcast, episode 15. I'm guitarist Pat Young. I'm here with guitarist Zach Town and drummer boy Mike York. Let's riff. What's up? Nothing. Nothing? All right. Well, thanks for listening, folks. Music and merch can be purchased at spiremetal.bandcamp.com. I'm not a guitarist. I don't know how to riff. Well, you're going to figure it out. You've only been on one. We need to tell 15 people what's been going on with you. All right. Cool? Mm Mm-hmm. All right. So you tracked in July Mm -hmm. at, is it Hoban Studios? Is that what they call it? Is it Hoban Studios? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tracked in July at Hoban Studios. And want to talk about your preparation for the record? What you did to get prepared for it? Because I know it was kind of, we were still playing shows. Mm -hmm. Uh, Against my will. Yeah, the show before it was, um, wasn't it in June with uh, Murder and Rue Morgue? Didn't we play in June? At, uh, it was in Auburn. It was in Auburn. Mm-hmm. And that was like the, the last one we did. So you were, you, you were still kind of, you had to get prepared for the record, but also we had to play a show too because that's what I do to you. Mm-hmm. So you want to talk about that? Sure. So The Haterade's fine. You can do the it. The Haterade, yeah. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't remember what the date was that we had the, that murder room morgue show. It's like the it was like the second to last week in June, yeah. towards okay. the end. Um, well, I recorded July tenth, eleventh, and twelfth. I do know those dates. Um, and I think uh, I was a little over prepared going in. Honestly, I kind of uh, what I guess what my process was. Uh, I would practice every day. Every day I would play straight through the record. Um, and whether it was after work or on the weekend, I would do it, you know, sometimes twice a day. And then I recorded on a Friday, took the day off of work. And the last time I had played was the Wednesday before that because I wanted to have a day off. Um, I think I should have given myself maybe a week to clear my head rather than trying to stress myself out because that's the thing I try not to do is be so prepared that I don't stress myself out, and I did the opposite. I kind of went in there, mm, you know, with a m- good attitude, um, with moderate stress instead of zero. Um, so when I when we got actually on Thursday, this isn't even that's not even true. The last time I played was Wednesday, and the last time I touched my drums before recording wasn't Wednesday. It was the Thursday before because we went there to set up, and I tuned my drums for six hours. Nice. That sounds like fun. Yeah. Well, how do you, how do you tune your drums? <laughs> <laughs> Dumb. <laughs> that's not the drum. That's that's me. That's you. Yeah. If I yell loud enough at it, it's in tune. The Bill O'Reilly drum tuning technique. Mm-hmm. Continue. Yep. So, <laughs> um, I actually had problems with um, my snare drum because I want what I did was I changed all the heads. Um, earlier in the week, so I could play through them, um, kind of like guitar strings. They, you know, they're going to go out of tune a little bit quicker um, if you just put them on. You know, chances are, um, I'm probably lying because I don't actually play guitar. You got to break them in. You can't just throw them on, right. and you have to actually break them in first. Right. So, what I did was I, you know, play a little bit, and then I, you know, stop like usual. And then Thursday, uh, the 9th of July day before we wanted to record and I took all my drums there and the intent was to tune and set up which is what I did but it took um, it needed to be perfect because I'm listening to these drums for the rest of my life drum tuning is a big deal yeah people don't realize that right um and it takes you can't just throw yourself into it like uh I tune by ear it's not necessarily by a tuner they make pretty cool tuners um, they make things that you can, um, put on all of the drum keys at one time, mm-hmm. 
and then you can actually hold the one handle at the top of all of that and turn it and it'll turn all the keys in unison which is pretty cool so they're all the same uh, but I'm actually we'd make fun of you for that though you'd make fun of me for that um, probably worse than you do now for that's not possible <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm actually a little more anal than that I actually like to go through each um, each lug separately and do it that way and then it's kind of like, you know, when you're tuning a guitar, you listen for that dissonant sound that you don't want. You want the same, you know, the same E for your soul or A that you're going for. Um, when in actuality, I'm not going for any, um, not even going for any particular note. I just know what I like my drums to sound like. So as as you got the you got the head on the on the drum, you're tightening it down, and you're going and you're taking the stick and you're hitting. Like, lining up with, like, by the lug nut, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there's probably, like, depending on the size of the drum, there's, like, five or six lug nuts on there, and you're going through, and you're hitting right next to them yep. because they all have a different, they all work in tension, right? I'm just doing this yeah. to explain, like, you know. Right. I'm not a, doing a very good job. A visual. Yeah. But they actually don't make five lug drums anymore. They used to. Sonar used to mm -hmm. do it a long time. But they, so I have six, and then on my, my big 16-inch drum, there's eight. Mm -hmm. Same as the bass drum, and then the snare drum has ten. Um, so, and a lot of people concentrate on the top head, which because that's what you hit. You know, it's mm -hmm. you know, the bottom head is out of sight, out of mind, mostly. But mo all of your tone comes from the bottom head, all of your tone. Mm. So, um, what I what I did before tuning, what I do for live, is I'll actually tune the bottom head a touch uh, of a higher pitch above the top head mm -hmm. so that it doesn't um, it doesn't ring so much right right so it kind of shortens the sound but when I I knew that Jamie King was going to be uh, mixing these drums so I wanted to make things as comfortable for him as possible so what I did was uh, I went on to see what he does and he said that he typically likes to tune both heads the same, which is fine. So that's what I did. I mm -hmm. tuned each, the bottom head on the top head the same. Yeah. So it would be... It's always going to be different from right. the live performance. And I'm not in North Carolina to for him to see me or to do these drums with him. So I wanted to make things as close to possi as possible for him to, to mix. So mm -hmm. um, there wasn't any... Uh, I guess further issues than there's going to be with a thousand tracks to make. Yeah, exactly. So, because there are a million tracks with drums. Right. So what I actually did with uh, I had a problem with my snare drum, and it was the last thing that I did because I wasn't getting the sound that I wanted. So I took I wanted to adjust the snares, and I don't regret doing it. But at the time I did because I didn't think I was going to be able to fix it. Mm -hmm. So I took actually. Um, and I did this with all the drums. I took all the bottom heads and the top heads completely off and started from scratch. But you have the snares on the bottom of the snare drum, obviously. So uh, that was a little challenging for me to get it back to where it was just uh, by the way that it's designed. But I finally got it because the problem was I would release the snares mm -hmm. and the, I would hit the drum hard enough you know, looking for a no snare sound, and it'd still, and it'd still be ringing out because they hang down. They just hang like you make it into you age the drum like right. eighty years right. it, instantly, just like sags down and then. <laughs> Instead gotcha. of a nice perky drum, is an eighty-year-old female drum. Yep. So if that's visually accepting for people. <laughs> That's fine. That's why I do podcasts because we can edit them. <laughs> That's really gross. So uh, you can get Mike Mike York's uh, signature snare drum. It comes with uh, girl parts. So when you're done drumming and you want to relax, yeah, and it's legal to beat them. So. <laughs> oh man, we just lost the one female fan we had. No, because no. I said I wouldn't actually hit a real female. Oh okay. The drum. Gotcha. So. Uh, after all this editing, anyway, <laughs> uh, 
I actually got all the drums to sound really sweet. I was really happy with them. Um, and that's actually something I've continued to do is tune both that has the same yeah. tone. Is because I enjoy the tone that I'm actually getting out of them. And I, instead of, because I use, um, everybody's got their own way to uh, muffle a drum. And what I do is I actually put a variety, uh, well, a different number of cotton balls in each drum, depending on the size of it, to um, to kind of help dampen the sound but not kill the tone. Mm -hmm. You don't throw a blanket in there anymore like in high school? That's what I did. No, I never did that. Yeah, I always did that. <laughs> I would put like a rubber ducky like pillow c case in there. That was awesome. That's why you're, you're drumming yeah. and I'm playing guitar. <laughs> um. No, it's, it's actually a um, something my old, my old man did, um, and I've been doing it since he kind of told me about it. And it was I thought it was a good idea because then you don't have anything uh, on the drum itself. Yeah, you don't use moon gels or anything, right? right? You don't. Like well, now I do because you do I now. Yeah, because since both of the heads are the same um, as far as tone, mm -hmm. I don't tune the higher one, uh, the bottom one, uh, a higher pitch anymore. So. It, it, I have a little more sound coming from the drum. Yeah. It resonates a little more. Yeah. So I use moon gels now. Okay. But I enjoy the tone getting out of the drum, so I don't think that'll be changing. And going into this, I got really fortunate to have a really nice kit to go in there with. Um, you mean, had just I, gotten your drum kit, right? That I was got it in the beginning of February. It was a, uh early Father's Day present from my father. So, wow! Thought, uh, yeah, it was nice of them to go out and spend, you know, a couple grand. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice drum set. <laughs> yeah, so um, the set I had before is really nice, right next to us. The PDP X7. At the time when I got that, that was a the top of the line that PDP offered, um, and it's a really great price. You know, it's I think it touched twelve hundred, mm -hmm. and you got a quality drum set out of it. But it's a child of DW. Which is what I have now. It's gotcha. Like a branch off of the tree. Hmm. So that you're going to get a quality drum. Yeah, it sounds great. So with these DWs, uh, I got the Performance Series, and they're just. I mean, they're it's a midline DW kit, but it's it just sounds top line. It's great. Gotcha. Now uh, I just want to back up a yeah a minute here. Uh, Preparing for the record, what what are you listening to when you like? What's your, what's your process when you actually when you sit down and you do that stuff? Like when you're like, okay, I'm gonna play Spire's new record. I'm gonna go in and track it. And you were tracking uh, first, mm -hmm. you know. So you're you're number one on the list. What do you practice into when you? Because we did do pre production. We did right. scratch tracks. I don't actually enjoy practicing to any music. Mm -hmm. I just I'm good with the metronome. If that's what I'm going to be tracking to, and with metal, everything's got to be exact, and it's very intricate. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to hear flaws. Right. So you want to be as exact as you can be. Um, so I just practice to a metronome. Uh, I think, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Zach, I think you had some tracks lined up for me with music, and I... I for a while, the first day was Friday the 10th, and we did Finding Up first. And for two or three hours, we I played along to the music. And I think I finally told you to cut the music. And then shortly after that, I had a complete take. Now, is that is that because, you know, we have distorted guitars? Is it even, it just loses its worth because you're, you're hitting so hard and you're, it kind of takes away from the preciseness of it. Is that what it is? Because you got this metronome is going beep boop 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 beep boop boop. It's I giving you the don't exact even use the accent. It's just straight, <clears throat> just straight no. That 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 that. Yeah, it's just annoying. But um, when you play in different timings, you know we're playing some weird timings. Yeah, we we have to actually calculate the gnome. metronome with an accent on one <clears throat> if we're playing in you know. 15, yeah, because we have stuff that restarts. You right. know. Um, that would that would throw me off, honestly. But because um, if you're doing it in a if you're doing it in a nine eight or whatever, 
it's kind of obnoxious to have it go, you know, like just to, so it has to kind of be, it like starts over. Yep. Um, so I, that's how I prepared too, was I played just to uh, the metronome. And I said I would give it a shot. He did all the work trying to get everything. He did what Zach did exactly what he needed to do that he, he felt, you know, he, I want to make Mike as comfortable as possible. Uh, so I'm going to put the metronome in. I'm going to line the music up exactly where it needs to be. And that's what he did for me because Zach's the man. But nice. I'm a douche, and I told him <laughs> to take all of the work that he did out of it <laughs> and just give me the metronome because that's what I was happy with. Um, and I, I always broke finding up into three movements, more or less. Mm-hmm. Like the first one, then you've got the uh, orchestra section, um, and then you've got the ending. And I'm not doing much during the orchestral section. I'm with cymbals and a few toms here and there. Right. Um, but I was able to get to the first movement, for lack of a better term. Uh, got a whole take out of that. and or uh, Yeah, in one take I got that. That was the that first one, one that you st- you started with. Finding up because it was pretty elaborate, right? That was your yeah. That's it's the most um, intricate, maybe. I yeah, guess. yeah. That one didn't exist, which mm-hmm. was second. Um, and then I ended. I did the same thing with the end of finding up, the third movement I got. Um, What's your hardest song? Hardest, most exhausting. Like song yeah, like the is is, is it, the exist exist. <laughs> yeah. Easiest song. I try not to make them easy. Um, the least challenging one, I guess, is the best term for it, is my side, the my side bias. Oh, okay. So I think that one took me 15 minutes to track. Yeah. And my I think I didn't my side it. got, collectively, it got the most pre-production mm-hmm. out of any mm-hmm. song that we've done, really. Right. My side has been redone and redone and redone, reworked, you know. Mm-hmm. Um we even did like the pre pre production vocals on it before we even went in to do it for real. Mm-hmm. We did those on there. I think that was a, for a matter of uh, who we were going to feature mm-hmm. on it because we definitely wanted a, a feature. It's leaning towards being our like the single, you know, the one that we push first at least. And so I, we ended up getting uh, Steve from the Summoned. They're a um, Boston, Massachusetts band. Yeah, brutal. Great. Brutal, brutal. Awesome. Yeah, so we got him on there for a little snippet. Um, yeah, so you're now we did your the preparation. Uh, you like to hear yourself and nobody else. I like that. It's the same thing live, unfortunately. I like it. You guys are always around. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so you're just happy with us. You're you're content with us standing next to you. You don't have a restraining order, but you right. don't want to hear us. Right. Uh, well, I just you want to hear some stuff, right? Don't you have a little bit? What's your live mix like? Um, I need to hear Jesse for the beginning of Star Cycle. Yeah. So uh, we all come in at the same time. Um, I need to hear Zach for uh, the end of Star Cycle, really, because he kind of goes into that. He takes us into that part. Um, and then for everything else, really, as far as I can think of right off the top of my head, I bring everybody into everything else Mm -hmm. as far as I can remember. Um, I can already tell you, I'm going to want you for like the uh, middle of always cold right before the, um, we have a cool little shuffle part in there. Yeah. I'm going to want you for that just because, um, well, in those cases you'd be keeping time, right? You'd be keeping like hi hat time. Yep. For me, because uh, you know that's like that's the yeah, our no, usual go to page, right? And if I can't be in one, if there's any doubt that I'm not in 100 percent control, you know, then I like to. I'm gonna have to hear whoever's uh, virtually taking us in. But in my monitor, I try not to have too much going on. I like just having my earplugs in and my internal metronome because that's all I practice to. So. Right. So you got the muscle memory laid out between songs. Uh, tracking experience. You went in, you did three days, right? Mm -hmm. 
How many hours was this of drumming? I think it, uh, I think it just brushed over 30. I in think. three days, so you're yeah. putting in 10-hour days. Yep. Plus the tuning on the day before. Right, but that's right. But like actual awesome, actual yeah. starting tracking. and. Um, all right, so at one point in time, we found out later that you blacked out. You don't remember it. I don't remember recording most of all, uh, It's Always Cold Up Here. Where in the sequence is this? Like, this is, uh, the, this is the last day. day. Yeah. So and you're saved. like halfway through the last day, right? No, because I saved the whole last day for the two newer songs. Yeah, yeah. That I was most unfamiliar with. Um, and that's kind of stretching it. With, it's always cold up here because I... Um, there were a few liberties to be taken with like yeah. fills and shit, right? Right. So there were still things that I was... Want, uh, wanting to make better or working out, mm-hmm. and then um, I'm just going to be giving away track names, I guess. With uh, ascend, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and with ascend, um, that's the that's instrumental. An Eleven-minute song, nearly, and uh, I wanted to really save that one for last because it's the one I had uh, touched the least. I guess mm-hmm. I had gone through it, but got a tempo change in it too right you know goes from what is it 125 to 140 yeah it speeds up it's a it's a deceptive song because it sounds really chill and it doesn't it's an instrumental but there's not like for a prog band there's not a like a million it's not a chop game it's not like we're just whittling around and doing crazy shit it's more of just like about layers and song and true song structure um the guitar is kind of um, emulate a verse, chorus, verse, chorus in the in the dead center of it, um, and then we end up bringing back a theme uh, at the end of the song that's a little quicker, you know, f- from the tempo oh, yeah. change. Uh, so it's not it's it's crazy. It's not like you don't even notice it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't notice it until you start the song right. over, um, and that's cool that you can that we can do that. You can get people to zone out, and then like you get brought back to reality, you start that track over, and it's like, oh, my God. Or even start the record over, because metal ac- re- metal records usually don't open and end the way that, that ours does. So, um, I don't know, whatever. I don't I don't give a shit. We're um, yeah, we're, oh, you were so brave. Well, you know what it, remi- it reminds me of? The start and end of Colors by Between the Barry to Me. Yeah, yeah, it really yeah. Because it starts with piano, and so does ours, ironically. Mm-hmm. And then... I was, it wasn't supposed to, though. It was kind of off the cuff. We started this thing with, you know, the majestic Jesse. Yeah. Because <laughs> he's incredible. The majesty. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we ended it with... Ha-ha! <laughs> 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 and then we ended it with uh, piano as well. And that's the same. It's That was intended because that was um, actually... Um, that's Ascend. That's just the song. And that's the same as Colors... Funny enough, also. Yeah. So yeah, it just it just worked out that way, and it ends up being it ends yep. up being pretty smooth, a oh, smooth yeah, start, a smooth ending. Um, but I yeah, don't remember actually tracking ascent? Yeah, there was well, there was a fill in there. Um, it's awesome, but I don't I don't remember doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't actually remember. Um, because I, I I the way that I found out that you don't that you didn't remember anything because you looked you looked like a shell of yourself like you you looked like we just used we used your body you know like when in those movies where like there's uh someone's possessed i look like that you looked like it but you also like where where they kind of act like they're they're like weak you know they're like ah, oh, but they still have this this evilness that's driving this insane amount of strength in like spurts and so you were just this shell with nothing left to give and then out of pure muscle memory like this the the drone of like we just we use your robotic uh limbs to just like like play the part you're like where do we where do we go from i'm like just start where you go dun, 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 dun. okay one two three four dun, 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 dun. like awesome fill and then we move on and and then you just like wilt you know like once that section was done what do we do next you were gone but i didn't know that you had no recollection of it 
And there was like the, neither, until... one of the biggest fills in that song. And in the record, really, it's a really elaborate fill that takes you, it's the turning point of the song, and mm-hmm. it takes you from this chill section. Uh, and then there's these unisons, then there's just this huge fill that leads into a big, you know, just like held out note. And you have this epic like lead guitar and synth part and there's cues in there and like that fill going into it, this huge elaborate fill was like the least like worked out thing it, it was you and i'm like what did, now what was that fill and that's when i found out that you blacked out because i'm like what was that fill that you played there that was actually that was really cool and you're like i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I'm like what i don't know um yeah it was uh as it was definitely an experience um it's nothing it's nothing i can't replicate now that i you know i'm hearing it and i'm yeah. like oh man that's pretty cool i'm gonna i'm gonna have to just keep doing that because it's awesome um, Don't keep blacking out, then, though. No, I mean that's not good. Um, but I'm listening to, I'm listening to this record before even Jamie had his hands on it, and I hear most of my power in that song. Yeah, I hear my strongest left hand, my strongest right, my my strongest footing in ascent. And I was, like you said, at my. I feel I know I was at my weakest point doing that song, and I was just. I knew it needed mentally to be. more so than physically. Like you're, yeah. you knew your that last little bit of you knew that that energy had to be whatever your energy was that you were conserving. Like you're surviving Mount Everest or something. Like whatever <laughs> energy I have left, I need to do for this song. <laughs> it was, um, yeah, exact, yeah, exactly. That's what it was. Crazy dude, and there was a couple of mishaps with like broken uh, stuff. Thank God it wasn't like passive when you crack the drum head and uh, during our oh, single. Yeah. Our single, there was a cracked drum head during passive progressive. Yeah, but, but it was, it, they were, well, it was the front head. The front head of the kick drum. Yeah, so you got a little bit of like a floppy sound. But right. when Steve Schwalick mixed that, you know, I let him know and he was able to work with that. Yeah. And he was able to use um, what he needed to from the front yeah. head and not. Use too much of it to where you're going to hear that. That's a song, though. That's a song. It's not an album. Right. <laughs> that would have, we would have well, uh, I, rescheduled. I made sure that I, I had everything fresh for that. I mean, I have AJ from Glass Skeleton. I even had him um, meet up with you, and you got me a new by top of the line Evans front drum head. Oh, yeah. I remember that. So to go with everything. And it had a plastic guard around the, um, the uh, bass drum, the head hole. So, um, it was li- at least less likely to uh, to break or to rip like the other one did. Yeah, because the other one was just it was just the head. Yeah. So okay. So what 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 parts broke on the? There was some stuff that happened with the um, drum kit. When we were doing "Always Cold," it was when I started getting frustrated, and I don't like getting frustrated. Um, day I, three. Yeah, day three. I don't take that approach to playing at all. Um, I go through. That's the only time. Um, and I'm going to say honestly, because I don't, uh, recall with another band, but I'm going to say with Spire, that's, uh, the only time I ever remember myself getting frustrated with myself, with this material, because, I mean, it's a lot, you got to factor in a lot. Um, that's hour 20 and you've never done a full length record before. Right. Correct. Right. I've done my own, which was yeah, yeah. Uh, it's more like an indie style. Yeah, yeah. You know, I won, I won, take all the drums and stuff. Um, but it was you know upwards of you know hour twenty or yeah. twenty five, mid middle of the day or so, and it was hot. Mm-hmm. Um, that was in the middle of summer. You made all that heat, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I got a picture of that thermostat like every step of the way. Um, it was. It was extremely hot, and, you know, obviously you can't have fans or air conditioning or anything going on because you'll hear it in the recording. So, um, and I'm used to recording, like, in February. Yeah. You know, where it's not a big deal. Um, You can't have the heat going, but you're in closed doors anyway. Um, And I don't recall myself ever getting frustrated, honestly, with this stuff. But I mean, taking into factor that it was hot, I was tired. Um, I had already been through, you know, all this stuff, and I know at this point I'm making excuses, but, uh, 
Ben Fackler. Nobody goes to the gym for 10 hours a day for three <laughs> days straight. At least have and, one day yeah, off. I guess. Um, and then factor in the reason I, I got it down to when I was actually rational about it and not blaming myself. Yeah. I was able to be rational about things and say that um, some of th- me having to take things more than once was me, without a doubt. Um, other stuff was, I mean, we had a giant microphone on my 8-inch Tom. I remember hitting that thing so many times, but it's we were trying to replicate Jamie King's studio or what he would use. What's the closest thing he would use to, to what he does for this stuff? So, What mic was that? I don't even remember. Zach, do you remember what mic? That's a good question. What did you so call it? We a, called one of them. It was like green foam. That was, oh, yeah, that uh, was Shrek Dick. Shrek that dick. was the Shrek Dick yeah, mic. That, was for my, that uh, didn't actually phone. end up in the recording, though. Right. Just was in the room for it was just in the room for presents. Well, it, it actually it helped me a lot when I was editing everything because it gave me a really sharp transient where there was a hit, so I could kind of go through and and you know make sure everything was lined up the way it was supposed to be. So that that helped, but I don't. We used a couple different mics on the toms, and I I don't remember what it was now. I I know we we definitely had a four t- MD four twenty one on the uh, the floor toms and. Uh, we had though. some other kind of Sennheiser on um, on the rack toms, but mm-hmm. again, yeah, they were they were big, they were they were big, like and for that eight inch tom. They were pretty mean, big dynamic microphones, a, and yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's a yeah. it's a the size it's, of a coffee can, more or less. And you're sticking a you know two and a half three inch diameter microphone on this thing, yeah, it in the middle up, of the drum takes up a lot of space, oh, yeah. gives you less space to hit, and yeah. You know, when so I'm hitting rim or I'm hitting the microphone. You're playing those parts that are uh, really challenging mm-hmm. to play. A lot of notes all. And as you're getting more mentally drained, it, yeah. you're re- yeah. relying more well, on the muscle helped. memory of it, yeah. and that was when it started to happen more and more. The more pissed you get, the more that issue that's frustrating you is going to happen gonna, or seem to happen. It's going to frustrate you more. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I ended up actually walking out during that song. I I gotta I gotta take him in. I'm like, oh shit, it's all right. I don't care. So, yeah, I just kind of set my headphones down, not nicely, and <laughs> <laughs> walked out the door. <laughs> and uh, I sat down on the floor, uh, like the board of my truck, just to like right on the outside of it, just to take a minute. And I was out there for probably ten minutes. Um, maybe a little less, and I came back inside. Zach came and gave me a pep talk, and uh, I think I needed that, and it was exactly what I needed because I, I felt also it. spanked you on the ass afterwards. But that was for something different. Oh, it was for play. Whatever. Not because I was being bad. Gotcha. I was. No, I, I thought I was. You're being not being, nice. I was being a coach. <laughs> being not nice. <laughs> I was being your little league coach. <laughs> Go get him, Tiger. <laughs> a coach, a coach with tenure. <laughs> so hey, he on, he good job. Me, this isn't, uh, this isn't you. You don't get like this. Um, I don't remember exactly what you said, but more some long lines, very motivating and very um, uplifting for me. It's what I needed at the time. You know, uh, you said, "I know you," and this isn't how you want to. Uh, this isn't how you want to be. So whatever you need to do to get back to your normal self of being positive, you need to do that. And, you know, we're here. We're going to get this done. It's going to be okay. And it put into perspective for me, and it sounds really lame. It does. But it did put in perspective for me that um, he was he was right. I let myself get like that. So um, I started. I was like, all right, man, thank you. And he walked inside, and I waited a couple minutes, took a couple breaths, Told him I was ready. We start doing the beginning of Always Cold Again, where I'm slamming on stuff. Um, it's uh, this strange polyrhythm, and I'm just slamming away on the china, and the goddamn fucking china stand broke. <laughs> and I went right back to where I was. <laughs> <laughs> you got this, man. God damn it. Fuck it. <laughs> 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 So uh, we funny if you were watching it like on TV, <laughs> not so funny in a 90 degree room. Right. Yeah. And then luckily, <laughs> especially when I'm just like, I can't even see you playing. And I'm just like, that was wrong. 
<laughs> what was wrong? The part where the the stand broke? <laughs> Not in the music. <laughs> so, uh, luckily, Brent's brother, um, God, I can't remember his name, but he left his he left his drum set there with a bunch of stands and stuff, and I was able to utilize one of his stands. Yeah. And we got picture. We have documentation of all this stuff too. And then throughout, I have a little symbol that gives me a short sound. Yeah. Like a, I use it as a tom, uh, kind of in that sense. And that started breaking during that mm-hmm. time. So I had limited use of it for Ascend. I guess if I'm going to have limited use of it, that would be the song. Um, and then I broke something else. What else did I break? I know. I'm trying to think about that. Well, oh, your your stand like kind of my stand my other stand for my symbol kept moving. Oh, it did <coughs> the bear, the bearing to where Zach had to come out into the studio, tell Pat how to work the computer, how to press record. This is on. <laughs> this is start. This is self destruct and lose all files. <laughs> Don't hit that one. <coughs> oh, thank God he didn't. Um, so I got my seal flippers out. And we arr, arr, right through that <laughs> shit. But it was really funny. I got footage of Zach. Actually, a picture of him, too. I don't know if he put it up on Facebook yet. But uh, of Zach, like, holding the symbol. It was really magical because it wasn't for, like, the entire song. It was for the last, the last, like, the ender. Like, the barn song. burner section for the end of this album. Um, where you actually, drum-wise, you, you, like, take it back to basics. It's oh, yeah. a real back-to-basics part, but you're also but hitting as hard... <laughs> But it is in 15A. Uh, it is in 15A. Uh, it, as basic as you can be in 15A. But, like, there's no fills. There's no... It's just... It's straight slamming. It's and it's the down. hardest yeah. that you that you hit on the on the record. And it's... Like you were saying, it's it's kind of cool that that shows. Like, you can hear that. You can hear evidence of that being that pow- powerful. Um, and then Zach's holding this cymbal stand up while you... And, and he's, like, rocking out to it, too. He's, like, got the, like, chicken hawk going on and the grit <laughs> gritty face, and he's, like, you know... He's, ro- he's like, basically, he's on one knee, so he's, like, worshipping you <laughs> as you're playing this part. That was really cool. And all he can hear is the That's drums. Moment. So, obviously, it was moving enough for him to enjoy it, just yeah. listening to drums and mostly cymbal. Right. Because it's a big, giant, huge, epic part. So... Yeah, I had a lot of support from everybody. I gotta say, could. man, I I loved tracking drums this time. We like we've done other projects recording drums ourselves, but it's never turned out anywhere close to the way this sounds. And mixing aside, because uh, mixing has made everything that we actually tracked sound it already sounded good, incredible. Going but like the actual raw tracks of drums, just the straight microphone signal i was really really pleased with like the uh the attack of all the toms like our close mics really got a a good um punch to all the tom drums uh the overheads filled out the rest of that and and made it real uh the kick drums got a lot of a lot of hit it like you know now we're listening to it mixed now and in the last stages of mixing as of today and it's like i mean it it hits you like a great kick drum and i'm i'm super happy that we're able to represent ourselves with real acoustic drums on this album same here rather than i wouldn't have it any other way using you know software instrument program drums or even or even doing which we never re- we never did rep- re- uh, replacement of of the drums we just right. did like you right. know you did like sampling in there to to blend it out right like uh, a, well to correct to, if yeah. there was something if there was a you know bum snare head every once right, in a while right, you right. would you would put that in but i mean but we never actually, used fake drums right we've always we never, used we never like used fake drums. drums we didn't even use like real sample replacement we didn't mm-hmm. use like we didn't replace every snare head with one good snare right head. right we right are using the actual the literal snare head that you did time so every time and that's like that to me that just that's really something to be proud of and that's why this whole thing takes so long you know like this this whole thing about doing a a 56 minute album in over one weekend we're spending roughly 30 hours actually like playing drums like really 
even the setup and stuff aside, like 30 hours playing drums, mm. all of the struggling that that weekend entailed, uh, this is the end result that 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 was all working up to, was having a, a kind of progressive metal album with a lot of challenging parts on it be played and recorded with a real acoustic drum kit. And that's... It sounds awesome, and that's the reason why all of that struggle was like worth it to us. Right. You don't really remember the struggle, or in your case, you don't really remember parts of your life during that. Um, <laughs> but you, weekend. you were, you, uh, you didn't struggle, and then were left with something that you had to deal with. Right. That's the part that you get paranoid on or get frustrated on, like especially with me, is that like. The reason why I get all like worked up about something is because I look down the road and I look like, oh man, like is this going to be something I have to deal with? I don't want to have to deal with this because with a recording, that's what pushes you through is to say, keep saying to yourself, I'm going to be listening to this for the rest of my life. You know, mm-hmm. is this what I'm going to be happy with? And you got that perfectionist attitude about your your own drumming, your craft. You know that that's really what it is. Is you you treat it like an art form. You're not a fucking rock star about it. Like you, it's an art form. It's like yep. This is this is what it's got to be. I like to be this. What I want it to be, I, and I was things that people that like you would you make executive decisions that um, we all do about our own instrument that people wouldn't even notice. We could play the same fucking recording, but it's it's what you, it's about you. You get it down to those those real details of what make you who you are as uh, as a musician. That's that's what like needs to happen for you. This is why we originally do it for us. You know, you do it for yourself. And those details that might not even be noticeable to anybody else, um, it's noticeable to you. And that's, like, what's most important, what you're going to want to hear as a representation of you as a musician and us as a band. I think that goes for any artist, really. Anybody who really wants to, who really has a passion for whether, like, you're drawing or painting or playing drums or singing, it's, like, because Jesse is the same way. Even, Even when we're recording him, and you're listening to his screams. You're like, "That was great." And he goes, "Nah, man. Uh, c- can I do it again?" And he does it again. And it's even for so- it's somehow more intense than he did the last time. Especially when he's mad at me. Yeah, we talked about that in the last podcast. <laughs> I don't even do it on purpose. I wish I could say I did. <laughs> I just make people mad in times of stress. <laughs> So how we're we're booking shows now? It looks like we're gonna have a, a like a release month for this record. Um, so how excited are you for the uh, for the road? The the nice uh, that hetero loving that you like to give us all on the on the road. I'm extremely excited for it. Uh, not just for the loving. You know, that's that's a given. It's going to happen, mm-hmm. whether, whether or not you give whether it. Whether or not, not other it. people want it or not. Pretty sure that's uh, that's Good. called something. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's called love. Um, okay. Uh, Four-letter word, right? Yeah. Um, but I am mostly excited because I've worked with a lot of great musicians um, for, you know, the years past and stuff. Uh, I didn't think in a million years that I would have ever... If you asked me 10 years ago if I wanted to be inspired when I'm, you know, now, <laughs> I would have said, no, that's okay. Because... That's because you heard us back then, 10 years ago. If, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's But it was... Uh, I had a different agenda. You know, I yeah. really did. I had a different agenda, and... and um. I still hadn't found what I wanted to play. I would have been honest about that back then, too, if, if if I was asked what I wanted to do. The only band that I was ever with that I truly, truly wanted to do anything with was a band called Kale Estes. Um, with Kyle Heath from How Did the Spirit Completely, R.I.P., of course. Um and a bunch of other guys. The band, not <laughs> Kyle. <laughs> the band. <laughs> yeah, no, Kyle's not. Kyle's very much alive. Don't freak out, everybody. <laughs> um, but a bunch of other great musicians too. Um, and I, I, I love being a part of that. And 
when it t and when it came time to when you asked me to be a part of Spire, I had been with uh, a cover band for you know five five years maybe maybe almost six, and that's all I've been doing is playing covers anywhere from like Ozzy to Journey and Foreigner and Sticks and all that stuff. Um, so I remember asking you, can I hear? something new what have you what have you been up to well here i'll send you the guitar pro i had no idea what the fuck guitar pro was uh of all the drums I'm what like, is okay. a guitar pro for <laughs> 500 <laughs> so you sent me guitar pro i'm like that's fucking great no, i just want to hear something so you sent me star cycle and at that point and i had respected discovery i really did i thought i thought you guys were finding where you you were starting to find where you wanted to be as a group, whether, if, even if I only include you, Lawrence, and Jesse, you know, because you guys have been in the part of the group the longest. Um, you and Lawrence, originals, you know, founders. So even if I only included you three, that statement would still stand that, you know, you guys were finding where you wanted to be uh, in the music world. So when you sent me Star Cycle, it completely turned me upside down. I was like, okay. This is the real deal. This is a song. This is a real song. So I said that, you know, you told me, I don't know how busy you're, you are right now, but I know how busy you're going to be because my son was due in a few months. So My timing is impeccable. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, let's try to get together sometime. So in September, you got a hold of me, and then October, we got together, and I, you know, long story short, from October to here we are, two years pretty much, later with a full-length record um and i wouldn't want to do it with another group of guys honestly um i wouldn't want to play this music or any music with another group of musicians i've had people tell me who loved previous bands um and i'm going to call them out right now rick elias text me when we were playing our last show during our set he was right next to me watch me and i saw him on his phone and the message that he was sending was to me saying you have it. This is it. This is the group you're supposed to be with, and they're supposed to be with you. So it's got to mean something from somebody who's been around a lot of music for a lot of years and has seen me in different groups. Mm -hmm. You know, it finally say, you found it. This is it. A lot of those guys have seen us in some form up on that Lost Horizon stage, mm -hmm. you know? A lot of those guys. There's a lot of growing. Right. Inspire up on, those stage, on that stage. There's a mm -hmm. lot of growing. You know, the the early college years that you guys had, and then now it's, to me, it sounds like two different bands. It's basically the same guys. I mean, added Zach and you added me. Mm -hmm. But it's it sounds like a, it just sounds like a whole different group of guys. It's, a, it's, it's really, it's really nice to be a part of something like that. Um something that I actually enjoy, that I can say this is what I want to play. This is this is what I want to be doing until I can't do it anymore, physically. So. Yeah, man. So I'm very, that's the exciting part. I guess I made that really long and drawn out more so than I needed to, but um, that's the most exciting part about all of this, is that it's ours and we can keep doing it. And it's, it's, I'm going to sound really queer for a minute, but it's a beautiful thing. It really is. It's, you don't get chemistry. You don't just get in a band and have chemistry. It doesn't work like that. I've been in a lot of groups. I know, you know, whether it, even cover bands, it's like you're playing covers, but you still need the chemistry. Mm -hmm. You still need, um, you have to have some sort of communication, not verbally, with the people you make music with. It has yeah. to be musical. Um, you feed off each other. You grow off each other. And that's exactly what we do. I believe we're all good influences for each other. We get pissed at each other sometimes. But what family has never gotten pissed at each other? When has that ever happened? You know? So The Cleavers. Yeah, they, no, they, they hate each other. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a great thing. Um, and I get to... You know, I get to be with this group of musicians, and we all get to together um, 
play this awesome record for people, whether it's in parts, whether it's just songs, or whether it's the whole thing front to back, which is awesome. It really is. It's got a good flow. Mm -hmm. It's almost... Uh, it's almost like it's not ours, I guess. Uh, it kind of sometimes if I think about, it, I'm like, how did we even get here? How did we grow to this point, to where we were? We made this music because it's not easy to play. It's well, it's it's hard to hear it. It's hard to hear it when all all you're used to hearing from it because we we have been the way the timing was with all of this. We have been playing the same material. Uh, coming off of Discovery, and we had this uh, year and a half, two year hiatus, and then we came back and we had you for two years, mm -hmm. where we really focused on the record. Uh, so we've been playing the material a lot, and the material was growing on stage, and we were constantly making changes to it, and we needed even newer material to round out the record. So it it's like the only thing you hear is like when if a, if somebody puts you through the board and you hear like the ghetto recordings from the live shows that doesn't do it justice right. you know because nothing is balanced or anything so all you're hearing you're just using you taking it as like a review of your performance and what we can improve on but it's not enjoyable to listen to um and then we did some pre-production on a few tracks and uh then when we started actually doing the the record like we were recording it in pieces so it's it had always been in pieces, rough mix. It's always been like that until recently. So when you finally get this thing back, it's like, you know, wow, like I actually I'm seeing this vision come to light, you know, like it really it really is happening and you only get that after everything is where it needs to be and sounding the way that you wanted it to sound and that's when you really get like taken back by it, you know. That first review of the um, the CD that I got to that I got to hear, I was just like, "This is crazy!" I'm getting like pumped up. Then we got our second, like, we got our second one back uh, the other day with the, all the changes that we made, and I'm like, I'm down here folding laundry like a hardcore kid. I'm down there like, yeah, oh, no, no. like I was screaming <laughs> the words and shit with my iPod. It's like. This is the this is a room uh, the basement I'm comfortable doing that because it's the one place in the world that isn't bugged or cameraed, <laughs> so to my knowledge, yeah. As far as you know, uh, is there anything else, man? Did you have anything else you wanted to say? No, I'm just uh, just happy to be part of it and uh, happy to. I would you know I want to urge people to come out to shows, um, not just to, not just and only to support local bands and sound cliche but to just to hear this stuff in person you know before you know come out to the the march show come out to the um cd release show and before you actually put that cd in your car come hear it live you know because it's both are going to be an experience you get to hear everything in its presence um and in its power live and you'll hear everything um everything else in the record, everything that you may have missed live because you were smashing face too hard. <laughs> but, um, no, I don't have, uh, I don't really have anything else. Yeah. That's it. tracking, everybody. It's a great way to stay in shape. All right, show updates. Saturday, March 19th, we'll be at the Lost Horizon in Syracuse. That's our CD release show. Um, probably on the... Next week, we got like one more podcast to do where we'll be uh, releasing all of the details and we'll probably have some more shows on the way too. That's all I'll say about it. Um, Saturday, March 19th. Mark it on your calendars, folks. Music and merch can be purchased at spiremetal.bandcamp.com. That's the Riffcast. Questions or comments, please email us at spirenymetal at gmail.com. For bonus material from these conversations and more updates on what we have going on, you can join our mailing list by going to spire.fanbridge.com. Thanks for listening, and see you in the show.